Welcome to Taiwan Report News Brief, news analysis and context from Taichung, Taiwan. All right, up today on the show, a new new power party poll is out. The legislative speaker wants to undo a DPP referendum reform from just last year. Fan Yun finds out she was a surveillance target. Will Johnny Chang survive as KMT chair until his term ends? We'll discuss. A poll shows Taiwanese views on fighting a war with China, and up first, a couple of headlines. The government budget for fiscal 2021 could see national defense spending increase to 335.8 billion NT, up 10 billion or 3% from fiscal 2020. If the 29 billion NT in special funding to purchase F-16 jets from the U.S. were included, the increase in, nas- in the national defense budget would be 7 percent. Independent legislator Freddie Lim, Lin Changzuo, has said he will propose a bill calling for the government to return the confiscated property or financial assets of those convicted of rebellion or sedition during the White Terror and martial law eras. Lim said the DPP has made progress in implementing transitional justice by passing laws since 2016, but its efforts have yet to address the assets owned by those wrongfully convicted or of rebellion or sedition that were confiscated by the government. And I'm glad he's getting to that. A new new power party poll showed that more than half of those questioned were confident in Taiwan's preparations against the Chinese military threat, with 26.1% feeling extremely confident and 24.9% feeling fairly confident. Meanwhile, 21% were not very confident and 19.4% did not feel confident at all, with 8.6% having no opinion. Regarding the relationship between Taiwan and China, 33.4% of people were inclined towards independence, 54.6% supported maintaining the status quo, and only 6.4% supporting reunification. That should be unification, but anyway. Though down 16.1% from the peak of the pandemic crisis, President Tsai's approval rating remains high at 60.8% with 30.1% disapproving. Premier Su's approval is also down, but still healthy at 56.1%, with 35.7% disapproving. The poll also showed that only 38.8% had faith in Chen Zhu's ability to remain impartial and nonpartisan as head of the control yuan. So it appears the KMT had a winning issue on that one. Legislative Speaker Yoshi Kwan has suggested holding a referendum in 2022, along with the nine in one elections, to deal with constitutional issues such as lowering the legal voting age and abolishing the control yuan and the examination yuan. An amendment to the Referendum Act last year decoupled referendums from national elections and stipulated that they be held every two years on the fourth Saturday of August starting next year. That was put in after the DPP was embarrassed by a series of referendum results they didn't like, including voting for nuclear power and against marriage equality. This has created a problem, however, for the referendum to be valid requires more than 9 million votes. Getting people to turn up on a, uh, to vote on a hot, sweaty August day to vote for a referendum is a tall order, and that was the point of the change in the first place. Now that they have something they want to pass, however, the legislative speaker apparently wants to change it back. Yo said that he met separately with the three opposition caucuses in April, and all of them agreed that the referendum for the proposed constitutional amendments should be held in tandem with the national elections. So it looks like they're going to undo their own referendum reform. DPP legislator Fan Yun on Saturday disclosed that she had recently found out that she had been a target of the KMT government in the early 90s, just a few years after martial law ended in Taiwan. She learned about it when the Transitional Justice Commission invited her to view an archive of more than 1,000 secret surveillance files against her. Fan was one of the leaders of the pro-democracy Wild Lily student movement in 1990. 
initiated by university students, the Wild Lily protests called for direct presidential elections and the establishment of a new National Assembly, among other democratic reforms. Taiwan nationally was still effectively a one-party state at that time. Fan wrote on Facebook, quote, the government was on my case for more than eight years from January 1990 to August 1998, adding that some of her peers at National Taiwan University were paid to act as informers. Their aim was to collect enough evidence to charge me with disrupting social order and campus peep peace, she said. At the time, Fan said the KMT had its fingers in NTU affairs, and both the school and the party were working against her. Some people say the KMT still has its fingers in NTU affairs. I was asked this question the other day. So, do you think Johnny's days as party chair are limited after this latest scandal? Some of the TV commentators certainly seem to think so. Of course, by latest scandal, he was referring to the revelation that KMT Kaohsiung mayoral candidate Jane Lee had plagiarized 96% of her master's thesis, and then she renounced her degree. By Johnny, he's referring to Johnny Chang, the KMT chairman. And this was my answer. I think he can hold on for now, although in theory, vetting candidates should be within his remit. This isn't a race for the presidency, so I think he can resist calls to resign, assuming no new scandals pop up. Those who already want him gone won't be happy, but he's got until at least Election Day on August 15th, I reckon. His problem now is to try and keep the Kaohsiung mayoral result from being a total blowout. I've seen in both UDN and China Times, both pro-KMT local papers, it's suggesting that he should resign if Lee drops below 31% of the vote, which was, by the way, the KMT result in 2014, or drops behind the TPP candidate. Then the pressure on him to resign will grow dramatically. If he survives that, a big if at this point, then he has to get his reforms through the party congress in mid-September. He's in a minefield, that's for sure. However, he does have two advantages which may see him serve out his term. First, many consider him a mere caretaker anyway. After all, he won in a by-election just a few months ago. Second, the KMT is in its, quote, darkest hour, as they're fond of saying, though I would have thought losing China would have qualified for that title, but that's just me. And it's a toxic post to hold right now with the party polling lower than at any time in history. I suspect those that are lining up for next May's chair election would be fine with him holding the bag and enacting reforms they can benefit from without having to expend any personal political capital themselves, especially Eric Chu or Zhu Lilun. Chu is clearly angling to run next May, and unlike the other heavyweights in the party, aside from the always reticent new Taipei mayor, Ho Yui, who has said nothing. He hasn't, by Eric Chu, hasn't, hasn't attacked Eric, Johnny Chang's reform plans. He equivocated by basically saying that Chang was enduring hardship and that reform is hard work. In the Chinese, it sounds better. Anyway, without saying one way or the other, whether he supported the reforms or not. Chang may survive on an argument inside the party of, is it worth having another election for chair when there's only less than a year left in the term? So it doesn't mean that, that the pressure for him to resign won't be high, but that could possibly temper it. Not being time sensitive, here's a story that I've held for a less busy day like today. About a week ago, the, the results of a poll on conscription and fighting an attack by China came out and was reported in the Taiwan News. About 75% of Taiwanese agree with the prep proposition that Taiwan should extend the period of military conscription instead of adopting a completely voluntary recruitment policy, according to a recent survey carried out by ET Today. Among the respondents, 50.8% strongly agree with the proposition, 24.4% slightly agree, 12% slightly disagree, 5.9% totally disagree, and 7% have no opinion. Now, before 2000, or the year 2000, Taiwan's conscription system mandated that all males over the age of 18 serve two years in the military. A few years before that, I think it was three, if memory serves. 
This has since been shortened to four months of basic training. The military experts and the young men who've gone through it I've spoken to say the four months of basic training is next to useless. And clearly, Taiwanese are aware of this, as the poll shows. The poll also showed if war were to break out between Taiwan and China, 40.9% of those surveyed said they are willing to fight or would not object to their family's participation, while 49.1% said the opposite. Compared to the results of a previous survey, the percentage of people willing to take up arms in defense of Taiwan or support family members in doing so has increased significantly. Those willing to fight for Taiwan are typically male between the ages of 30 and 39 and with party affiliations slanting toward the Green Coalition, which includes supporters of the Democratic Progressive Party and the New Power Party, among others. Now, most likely pretty much everyone above the age of 40 or 50 put themselves in the won't fight category simply because they reckon they're too old. Because of gender roles instilled in women here from a young age, it wouldn't surprise me if most said they wouldn't fight either, simply because they assume that's something for the men to do. In practice, however, I suspect a lot of women would in the end fight, no matter what they, they may think now. The women of Hong Kong in the last few years have shown the kind of strength and bravery battling for freedom that I expect Taiwanese have in them, whether they know it now or not. Well, the Taiwan News headline was nearly half of Taiwanese unwilling to fight to defend nation. I think actually 41 percent is a fairly high number considering. However, last summer I spoke to a young man about to go to university and I asked him if he would fight if China attacked. And he said no. He pointed out, which is an interesting point, that without a few years training, he figured he'd be useless on the battlefield. Essentially, he figured he'd just be cannon fodder. Well, let's hope we never have to find out. I'm delighted to welcome Simon, our newest patron on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, Simon. It means a lot to us. Without you guys, this show couldn't go on. And of course, please hit like and subscribe and the little bell on YouTube so that you get the, the fastest notification of the latest show. All right. Be sure to tune in for the next show. See you then. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw.